So I'm going to talk about three things. Why are we going to do that? I'll do that quickly. I, I think uh, Paul has made the case excellently and, and we are moving beyond that. I'll talk about what does that mean in practice in, in our countries and I'll talk a little bit about how the World Bank can contribute. Now, um, I think I, I use this slide to make the point that not only are population growing, but this has big spatial consequences. Now, this is a picture of Lagos, and it's based on uh, satellite pictures from, 2000, from 1986, 2002, and now we have, with a little bit of mathematical modeling, looked at what happens to Lagos in the future. And note how the city is spreading out, and note how it's sp spreading out into the red areas, which are those that are very prone to flooding. So you really need to think about, as an urban planner, where, where do you provide incentives for people to move? You know, where, where do you build the roads? Do you really want people to move out here or to move out here in these, in these flooded areas? So, so the urban planner types need to, to talk with the water uh, people as well and start thinking, thinking about these things. If they don't, this is what happens. Uh, the, the, the picture from Moldova is actually one of my favorites because it demonstrates why transport engineers should also take a course in hydrology. The, the, the reason why Chisinau looks like this is actually the way they built their roads. Excellent roads, except when they had heavy rains, they became rivers. Quite unnecessarily, unnecessarily so. Um, now, this slide, I think, is, 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 is quite shocking. And, 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 and for those of you who are numbers guys and, and, and girls, what this really tells us is in 20 years, water demand in Africa is going to be somewhere between three or four times bigger than it was. This is huge. In 20 years, a doubling almost twice. This is completely huge, and, and, it, and it links up to what Paul said about the cities not being built yet. I mean, it has that other side to it. It's a huge, huge challenge, but there's also a huge potential because much of that uh, demand is going to come from places that are not built yet, from, from, from houses, from structures, etc., cetera, that, that, that are not built yet. Um, now. Okay, here we go. Now, um, we, we had a discussion just before we started out here, and, and the question was, now what's different today compared to when Europe and the US went through a similar challenge 150 years ago? And I would venture that there are two things that are different, and this is one of them. Water is no longer readily available water is actually becoming scarce. It's becoming scarce in places where it was never scarce before and where you didn't expect it to be scarce. And the other thing that is different now compared to 150 years ago is that technology has actually progressed. So small decentralized solutions may actually be cost effective today, whereas when you built the big sewer systems in, 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 in London and stuff, there was no such thing as small decentralized solutions that could serve the same purpose in a, in a cost effective manner. Now, why is water supply scarce? Well, that's basically because people are moving uh, up the hills just outside the city and they're doing a lot of farming and they're using the water to grow food which is all fine and well, except that that means that the water does no longer go to the rivers, in particular in the dry season, and is no longer available for the cities. So it's a huge problem what happens. This is Nairobi in 2009. And, and basically, Nairobi is being fed, these, these uh, reservoirs are being fed by rivers in some of the water towers in Kenya. It is completely unheard of until a few years ago that you didn't have that you didn't have water, even if you have cyclical uh, summers there. But, but this, is, this is happening, it happened in Nairobi. We had a couple of, of, of case studies in Uganda, uh, in Mbale, some of you might know that is on, on the border to, to, to Kenya, another, another mountainous area, lots of water. I was there in the middle of March, they had had water rationing since the middle of February first time ever in that city. They were completely shocked. They had cholera, all, all the rest of it. And the, and the reason simply was they were used to take their water from two different rivers, 
One of them had dried up in the dry season, and the other one had, had lots of turbidity, so they had really problems with, with their treatment plant, right? And, and that, again, was people had moved up the hills, they had started to do farming, and that combined with a somewhat, but not particularly dry summer, just uh, cut them off for, for water for a couple of months. So what can we do about it? I think, I think it's obvious that we have a problem, that we need to deal with it, and that we have to deal with it differently than, than we used to. And even in my good state, the conservative organization, that's, that's an accepted uh, case today. What's not so trivial is actually what, what, what to do about it. Um, we did together with, with IWA, uh, ICLE, and, and a couple of other uh, partners, uh, uh, National Water and Sewage Corporation in, 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 in Uganda, we did a couple of case studies in mid-sized cities in Uganda. And the reason we did case studies in mid-sized cities in Uganda is the slide that Paul showed about where is urbanization taking place. There's a lot of focus on the Nairobis and the Manilas of this world. But the big, big urbanization is actually taking place in the Masindas, uh, Mbale, the Aruas, these places. Um, so this is, this, is, this is a city in, uh, in northwestern uh, Uganda. They have something like 70,000 people uh, at the moment. They'll have 140,000 in 15 years because they have a, 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 a vibrant trade with Congo. Um, so uh, a lot of people are, 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 are moving there. They have this, 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 this small river that you, see, that you see out here that they're currently using uh, it, with a conventional treatment plant. Then they supply potable water to, uh, in fact, most of the city. They, they're supplying 70% of, 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 the, of the current city with, 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 with potable water. Uh, now, what happens to the water afterwards, nobody really knows, and you really don't want to know either. Um, so, what are we looking at for that city? And, and, and the reason that I'm going to say this is that this, this river no longer really has enough water for, 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 for a doubling of the, of the growth. So they had this, this great idea that they are only uh, 50, 60 kilometers from the Nile River, so they can get the water from there. And it's true, they can. Just one small problem they have to lift it 700 meters to the air to get it up from the Nile to the city. So it's kind of, hmm, yes, you can, but can you afford it? So, so what we're looking at is what are the alternatives to, to, to actually getting, uh, getting water from the River Nile. Now, groundwater is one of them. Uh, it's shocking, to say the least, how little we know about groundwater. I mean, basically, we know that in a lot of cities in Africa, more than half of the water supply is from groundwater. But it's all informal. It's people having their, their own yachts and wells. We don't know anything about the quality, etc. And we really don't know what are the groundwater sources out there. And even when we do, many of my engineering friends are kind of conservative. You know, it's a mess. All these small wells. No, no, a big, good surface water source, that we know what is. So the first thing we looked at, of course, was, 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 was groundwater. Quite interestingly, in this, in this city, um, an engineer had just uh, finished a study, and they had identified three uh, potential groundwater sources that could supply something like 10, 15 percent of what, what water demand we foresee here in 20 years. And naive as I was, I was like, but why only three? Is that the groundwater that there is? No, 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 but that was the money we had for, 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 for boring the, the, the test wells. Well, they were, all three of them were actually positive, but we didn't have any more money, so now we're planning for three wells. I mean, this just tells you how basic the problem is among ourselves, right? So um, we were a bit conservative here, so we said, okay, maybe these are the three only wells that we, that we hit uh, with a 100% with hit rate, so we need to think about something else. So, so we're looking at uh, some decentralized wastewater treatment. We're looking at uh, what to do with the black water. Again, we were quite conservative and say we'll treat it, but we'll discharge it to the river. But the gray water, we will actually treat, and then we will recharge it to the groundwater, and then we will put it back into the pipes. Now, there are a couple of reasons why we're talking about recharging it to the groundwater. The, the first one is the yuck effect. I mean, it's really difficult to sell the idea to people that you have 
spray water directly in, in your pipe. And the second one is you have to be a bit careful because if you make an engineering mistake, it is really yuck. Um, so, oops, this is the wrong one. Um, now, what does this cost? And, and the numbers here are not, so I'm, I've, I've done a small calculation in my head for you. If you translate all of this, so that's basically water supply, it's distribution, it's collection again, it's some sort of tre treatment and discharge, we're talking about 80 American cents per cubic meter. It's not very, very cheap, but it's manageable. I think that is, that is made really the big point here is we need to change our mindset because just 20 years ago, this was not manageable. But what has happened is that technologies have been developed that allow us to do small scale stuff. You know, much of the economies of scale that I was taught in school and you were taught in school no longer is, is true. So that, that, that has changed the calculation. Yeah, that was just to show that, you know, we're talking about quite simple stuff. So here, this is their system, uh, system, which then the process of upgrading the water treatment plant. So this is what they've got, more or less. Then we are suggesting to add the groundwater. That is not contentious. Everybody agrees that's a good idea. And then they are suggesting to add the River Nile, which will solve their problem. I mean, I'm not arguing it will not solve their problem. I cannot imagine the city of Aurora being you know, so big that, that it cannot solve that problem. The only small hitch here is that it's going to cost you more than $3 per cubic meter. So it's, it's a bit stiff. Um, I'm not a good friend with that one, am I? Um, but what they can do instead is that you can actually uh, build a small dam across the river, which you need to keep some of the water for the dry season. You can look at wastewater recycling, and you can look at great water reuse. And then you have, again, basically doubled your water supply, but at a completely different cost. I mean, at a cost of the 75, 80 cents per, per cubic meter. There is a cost range on it, but this is really the average cost. So it's, it's really completely different cost calculation if you think in a non-traditional non way. And maintaining, and maintaining a pressurized steel pipe you know, that, that has a lift of 700 meters is not, is not trivial, my, my, my engineering friends tell me. Um, just a few slides to show it's actually happening already in different places. Here we have Naivashi in Kenya, where, where they have a, 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 a small system of, of uh, getting uh, biogas from, from their wastewater, and then they are selling it uh, next door, uh, where they're using it to cook. Uh, Durban, we'll hear more about that, but one of the, 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 the intriguing things here is that, that reclaimed wastewater is being reused in industry and not, thus saving 7% of the fresh water. Uh, Windhoek is, 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 uh, is, is probably the only place in the world I know where they are actually pumping black water back into the, into the water supply pipes. I don't know if you know about anywhere else, but here they are doing it, and as much as 20% of, of the water supply. Of course, the, the, the situation in Windhoek is special. I mean, at the time they built that plant, the alternative was basically to move 600 kilometers out of the city to find water. Today it looks different, they found other sources, but at that time. But, but while Windhoek is, is special, it's not Singapore and it's not New York, it's Windhoek. So I think the point I'm trying to make here is you can actually do some of this uh, uh, quite advanced stuff if you, if you have to, and makes you think, hmm, maybe I can do it as well if I'm not yet in a desperate uh, situation. Now, how can the World Bank uh, contribute to this? Well, the first thing uh, we can do and, and, and have started to do is, is together with our colleagues in IWA, we're trying to link up uh, to ICLE and other partners who want to join as well, is basically to spread the gospel. Um, so, so we are trying to put together what we're calling a, a learning alliance uh, for, for, for Africa. The second thing is we have to admit and as an economist, it hurts me to admit it, but I'll do it here if you promise not to tell anybody outside this room. We still don't know enough about the financial and institutional implications. 
We're much further. The engineers in this case are actually much ahead of us in thinking about these structures. We have really not thought enough about what are the institutional requirements, what are the implications, and what are the financial implications. Like these case studies we did were some of the first case studies where some, some people actually tried to cost this stuff. Um, the, th the third thing we are, we are, we're going to do is uh, we're going actually to try to put some of these pilots into practice. And uh, I was in charge of, of a small analytical report that came out here in June, and we looked at Nairobi and these two towns in, in, uh, in Uganda. And I'm very pleased to say that Ati Water Services Board uh, that, 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 that covers Nairobi actually uh, yesterday evening sent me terms of reference uh, for a consultant for, for me to comment on, and those terms of reference basically says, you know, look at the work that Michael and his team did, review it, tell us if you think it's okay, and give us a detailed design for how to implement it in a specific pilot area. I mean, things are actually happening. In January, when we went there the first time, it was like, no, no, we're doing this already, no need to do anything new, etc. And now we're six months later. So, so I'm very positive and, and thinking that, you know, you can actually make a change, but, but you do need to preach the gospel. Um, so we can, uh, we can play a leading role. Uh, what I'm saying to, to, to my colleagues back home is that that uh, requires that if our urban planner colleagues make a plan and they haven't thought about water management, we have to send it back to them. If our transport colleagues make a transport plan and they haven't thought about how that impacts on land use, settlements, and, that, and thus water, we have to send it back to them. And if our water colleagues make a water supply master plan and they haven't thought about how they are impacting the watershed and how they are being impacted by the watershed upstream, we have to send it back. Thank you very much.